Welcome to Ear Biscuits, I'm Link. And I'm Rhett. Joining us today at the round table of dim lighting is a hilarious YouTuber and comedian, Lee Newton. Of course, you know Lee as one of the co-hosts of the popular news and current events show on YouTube, SourceFed. Hi, welcome back to SourceFed, I'm Lee Newton. And I'm Steve Zaragoza. Steve, I've had many heroes, Chris Farley, Lucille Ball, Anne Frank, Ralph Waldo Emerson, the cast of Heroes. Sure, of course. But a robber from Jacksonville, Florida might have to be added to my list. Why? A robber, or hero, robbed Jerome Barbecue last week and stole $4,000 worth of chicken, wings, and fries from the restaurant. Now, sure, I know what you're thinking. Wait, a hero's a thief. Why are you guys praising him? But this is farce. Keep up, jerks. Also, how did he do it, and why? Now, we've always known Lee is extremely funny, intelligent. We've enjoyed collaborating with her. She was a guest on The Mythical Show, but we didn't really know her too well personally, and we definitely didn't know the backstory of the health problems that she has dealt with since she was a child. Yeah, I, I really appreciated her candor, and uh, we got to a lot of good things. Um, in addition to that, we talked about homemade jams, Yeah, her landing a spot on the Maxim Top 100, and I really enjoyed getting her perspective very thoughtful on women in comedy. Yeah, and we also heard her uh, story about her embarrassing herself in Target. Oh yeah. Uh, we'd like to thank our sponsor Sherry's Berries uh, for giving me a reason to eat berries again. Namely because they're coated in chocolate, white, milk, or dark. Also topped with chocolate chips, decorative swizzle. Swizzle. Or nuts. In the house. Basically the perfect delivery mechanism for all of those things is a berry. Uh, and we, we got some of these for the crew here, uh, and I will say that they broke them out and ate all of them before they told us that they had them. You didn't get one? I didn't get any. I'm, okay. You got some? Yeah. How many did you get? Three? I mean, what's three? They're, they're huge berries, I but I mean, I could have probably eaten seven. Did, did you not think that you needed to ask me? You know I, I assumed, like this kind of thing. I assumed, uh, you know, who I'm, I can't keep track of everybody's berries. I'm getting a batch for myself. Uh, if you're one of the 99.3% of people who have yet to figure out where they're gonna get their sweetheart for Valentine's Day, uh, we can make it easy for you. Go to Berries.com, that's B-E-R-R-I-E-S.com. Click on the microphone and type in our code, Rhett and Link, so they know we'll send you. And uh, if you use that code, you get a chance to double the berries for $10 more. I love the fact that they own the website, Berries.com. I mean, that's legitimizing to me. I wonder if they bought that from someone or if they were it just like sitting on it a long time. It, I mean, I don't care. But what the more important message to me is that they own berries.com. And they're doing something with it. Their berries are covered in, in chocolate and goodness as a berry should be. Right, is the person who owns cantaloupe.com, are they doing something useful with it? Are, I don't know, I don't are, go there. Are they coating their cantaloupes in chocolate and swizzling nuts? Uh, probably not. Assortments start at nineteen ninety nine, and you can get over a 40% savings off regular price. Thanks, Sherry's Berries. Okay, let's get into this Ear Biscuit with Lee Newton. I believe you will enjoy it as much as we did. Okay, Lee, I, I've been stalking you on Twitter. On December, oh, no. December 30th, you tweeted, uh, just bought a Taylor Swift album at a Walmart. I am America. I am America. So I'm assuming that you were not around here if you were at a Walmart, because nobody goes no, to Walmart. No, I was actually here. up north uh, where home is, and mm -hmm. I was on my way to home, and there was a Walmart, because again, there are no Walmarts in LA. Yeah. And I was there, and I bought a Taylor Swift album, because also it was like $8.99. <laughs> So, so I can't did you? Fight that. Yeah. Did you? Were you looking for no, a Walmart I so was, that you could buy a Taylor Swift? If you want to know, I was looking for a Walmart so I could purchase jars because I make jam for Christmas every year, and Walmart has the best jar yeah, yeah, prices yeah. for jam. Everyone knows it. Of like course. mason jars. Like mason jars for jam. You make jam. I make jam. I do. So you go home to where? I go home to Yosemite. Uh, well, a little town right outside of Yosemite, actually. But I say Yosemite because no one knows where coarse gold is. Coarse gold? Coarse gold. Coarse gold. Coarse gold. We found some gold, exactly but it's coarse. that's exactly what it's like, is coarse gold. Like a mining town? It's a mining town. It is, and it still actually has like weird little mining things that you can always find, and you can find yeah. mining holes and 
you go there and it's magical. But and... there's not a Walmart in Coarse Gold proper. God, no, no. There's a Walmart like in Fresno, which is about an hour away from Coarse okay. Gold. Okay, in route. So you um, stop route, there. Yes. I'm going to get my mason jars on the I'm way. i get my mason jars so and, I can jam. And then you make the jam once you get back in the homestead. Yes, I mean, I make a lot of it at my home in LA, but still there's stuff, you know, like I go up north uh, before Christmas because I still very much love and adore my parents. Some people uh, don't feel that way. I About your parents? No, um, no, actually, I think most people love and adore them. They're kind okay. of one of those, they're those people that you just, they're just the most delightful humans in the world and you just love them and I want to be around them all the time and I- Really? You yes, do jam with them? I do, I do. I would never live with them because I think I would drive them insane. <laughs> but also, and they would too because they love elementary on CBS and I can't get into it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is the jam making a family- Affair, or is uh, it like I'm going to make jam alone and give ago, it to you Three years ago, my father's the most impos- impossible person to buy presents for ever because when he's one of those that like if he wants something he gets it and that's what it is and he researches it. And well, he better. deserves it. He deserves it. He works hard. He's a great but guy. Everybody he's likes a him. Great guy. Everyone likes him. So I uh, last year, like three years ago, I was like, I'm going to make jam for him. I'm just going to because he likes sweet things. Had he you ever jam. made jam? No, never. Had you made stuff like yeah, foods? I make foods. I'm you know it's a natural propensity towards women that we bake. You know, but yeah, I'd made stuff and then I just decided to make him jam and then it like, I turned out to be okay at it. And became then- Became a thing. What it kind of jam? Uh, well, I have Auntie Lee's uh, jam. Uh, the one that is really big is Razzmatazz. It's like a lemon raspberry so jam. Y- You've branded it. I branded Lee's. it now. Yes, I have 100% oh branded goodness. it now. And now, like, the brother in law is like, I don't care what you get me. I just need jam. Like it's just <laughs> it's that good. It's a, it's a thing. It's a thing now. So all types. You all got... types. I got Razzmatazz, Blackberry Fields is a real, another really big one. Strawberry Fields, but that's like with a little bit of apple. Like there's a lot of different things. Oh, this wow. last year I tried a Christmas one. It was like cranberry and apple and. A so lot are you of gonna? Stuff. Are you thinking about like fallback career or something? I'm thinking Shark Tank, but maybe that's just me. <laughs> like, hey sharks, I'm here for Christmas jam, <laughs> but but. I just don't see it taking off much further than my father and brother-in-law's palate and actually everyone in my family because we're big sweet tooth people. Do you have stickers? Auntie Lee's Mm -hmm. stickers? Oh, wow. I do, in fact. That you print on an inkjet? I do, in fact. That is nice. But sometimes I handwrite them because it's so much nicer. It's like, like to yeah, do a handwritten. Like, Auntie Lee made this. Auntie Lee made this. Yay for you. (laughs) It's good to to be able to give a gift that is something that you've created. Yes. Especially if the people like it. Yes. It's like a big deal. Because yeah, then, it, that's like the that's like the perfect alignment for a great gift. Everyone can have a scarf, you know? Like it's just a thing. Right. So. My dad um makes his own barbecue sauce. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm not, I don't know if I told you this or you've had it, but it's I've a, had it. It's a tomato on chicken. Oh, yeah, man. it's a chicken barbecue sauce mm-hmm. more than a more than a pork, but you can put it on anything. It's it's a vinegary but still tomatoey based thing, it's which beautiful. is is a very North Carolina type. Yeah, thing. oh yeah. No need to go into detail except that at Christmas time, we all meet at his mom's house, Nana and Papa's house. Oh. Have more people than ever this past Christmas, and everyone's opening their gifts, and then we finally get to a point where. Dad leaves the room and then he comes back and he's got these big jugs. jugs. And he's, he's handing out jugs and it's just like Do you have Costco a, a, a size. Bow on the jug? It's just Costco. No. Like a two and from you sticker? Need a bow. Nothing. You need a bow. He need, you you need got to gift size it. No, no, you don't. I guess <laughs> if, once you taste it, you're happy, I guess. Okay. It's his All philosophy. Right. But, he, but they're <laughs> just reused uh, ketchup Costco oh, yeah, like size Heinz. bottles, like huge mm. ones. And, but I don't get one because. Of the cross country uh, trek Whoa. and everything. Yes. Yeah, you don't want that vinegar sauce going. Here's the thing: your my dad used to order barbecue sauce from a man in Mississippi that made it out of his basement, and it was like. And he recently, the old guy passed away apparently, and my oh. dad was like hoarding it. But that stuff is worth its weight in gold, and he better ship it to you if it's good. I mean, if you can put it on, a, I'm a big barbecue sauce on everything. Kind I, of I I really like your dad. Maybe yeah, we, maybe we cool, work man. out a maybe really we work sweet. out a trade here. Yeah, I think that's like what you know, jam for sauce. Yeah, I'm just saying. You know, a, a man who has that kind of discretion about barbecue sauce, and he does. You like, know, dry the, rubs like. Oh, uh, yes. what does Diana. your dad do? He's a pastor. Really? Yes. What, what Of what variety? It's actually a non-denominational church, and okay. it's uh, up again uh, in the mountain area. Does he have and a beard? 
No, he has a mustache. <laughs> oh, a, he has a mustache. He has only He's a mustache. He's always had a mustache. Hold on. I think I remember you showing us a picture of your dad's I mustache have, one time. Maybe. I'm, that's coming back to me. Maybe when we shot for the mythical show, it's something yeah, came it's up your, conversation. It's your home screen on your phone. Yes. It probably might have been my home screen on my, my beautiful parents' is a home screen on my phone. So what, I mean, is this like a, a small valley church or a a Actually, to be honest, it's church. actually a, a pretty big church, especially for the area. It's actually a very big church and they kind of, um, they're non-denominational and they're very open loving and they kind of specialize in people that, a recover our recovery like so you know addicts and all that they have a lot of programs okay. for those like wonderful people and it's kind of they have big hearts in that sense so. and so is it, was this what he's he's done your entire life mm -hmm. so you grew up as a, yes, a, a I pk think they, they call it i grew it. up as a pk a pastor's kid and uh i think i was a big reason why he went back into the ministry because really before me he was doing just fine in real estate actually more fine than i think he ever did in ministry um, as far as like money wise. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, it was a big reason why he went back into the ministry because I came along and I had a horrific heart problem and it kind of- Oh, me, come along mean born. Born. Okay. Yeah, born. So he went into the ministry, he wanted to be a minister and then and then he got caught up in life and then he was really good at real estate and then he was really good at business and he was making a lot of money. They lived in Oregon and you know, him and my mom both, you know, he retired at- Mid thirties and and had a whole bunch of you know we had a goats and uh, kind of like a big thing out in a big ranch out in Oregon and then and then I came along and the company went under and I had a horrible heart problem and and so it was kind of a big reassess moment for him I think okay so let's decided. horrible heart moment yeah. let's, uh, horrible let's, heart moment let's get into this <laughs> problem it's my yeah. new uh, yeah. TV show horrible heart moment <laughs> <laughs> that is what he said so let, uh, let's unpack it. Mm -hmm. I mean, and and it, I mean, it must. This must be big. Yeah, it sounds big. When it is when big. was this discovered? Uh, this was discovered. I was born uh to a midwife. Like I was born in a, with a midwife because my mom had had both of her other kids, older brother and sister, in a hospital. So you know, low low chances of anything bad happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was also the eighties, so they didn't know better. Um, <laughs> but uh, they had me to a midwife, and then I um, and then I. 14 days into it, I think my father was like, something's wrong. Like, the kid's blue and not responding, not responding in the way that she should. And mm -hmm. my mother was like, she's perfect. Leave her alone. She's my baby because mothers do that. There's a uh -huh. lot of hormones. And um, and then it was one of those things where he was like, no, we're going to the hospital. So it took me to the hospital. At 14 days, I had my first open heart surgery. Um, because uh, basically what it is in a long term is my heart is backwards. Two out of the four chambers were missing. The Antarctic arc was fused. A lot of like a like valves and yada yada yada. So you seem to have just lift list at least four four major things, problems, major with, things. Yes, yeah. Missing chambers, missing chambers, backwards. backwards. Well, that's, those um, are two big ones, right? Yeah, there. ventral septal defect, atrial septal defect, pulmonary stenosis, transposition of the great vessels is what the technical terms of it all are, uh, but it basically means that. You know, missing valves, uh, needing valves needing to be replaced, uh, missing chambers, yada, yada. But the cool thing is, if all of that hadn't been, if I had just had one diagnosis, I would have been dead. If I had just had two of the diagnoses, I would have been dead. But because I had multiple ones of them, they all kind of worked out. All the to problems where, worked all the together problems to worked make together you together to make me alive viable. for 14 days. Wow. So, yeah. So, I mean, it, you know, it's kind of a magical, beautiful thing. And so what did and they so, do when they so went in? So they went in, uh, when I was a baby, they went in through my back because I was little and they can't go in through your front. And so they basically, uh, you know, patched up the uh, are the holes in my heart and then they reworked everything to where it's still backwards. It will always be backwards. It's just what it is. They can't flip it because that's apparently really dangerous um, to flip a heart wow. <laughs> uh, that's already connected to everything. So rewired everything, did a valve, and then... Throughout my whole life, I've had, at two years, I had another one. It was more like 14 months, I had another one. And then at seven, I had a really big one, which is replacing this valve and making sure everything is actually succinct and okay because it was a heart growing and they needed to fix it. Mm -hmm. And then at 13, I had another yeah. one. And there's, you know, I mean, there's a lot of different multiple things that go along with it. So you, I mean, so you remember the seven-year-old one. I remember the seven-year-old one viciously. Yeah, uh, I remember but not like... 
13 months old, you would not no, remember that. No, I know. I don't remember that. I remember being a sick kid. That's all I remember. And I only because. Well, yeah, so what were the symptoms as a, you know, four, five, uh, six year old? I, well, four, five, six year old, I would always be blue. So I always had ex- oxygen deprivation. So I was always had blue lips, blue face. It was called, they're called blue babies, actually, with people with heart problems. Really? And so I would always have blue lips. And people, I was also very little. I was so little. I was 45 pounds at like five years old, which mm-hmm. is so small. And people always just thought I was a genius when in reality, they're like, that two-year-old's brilliant. I'm like, no, nah, she's five. A little blue, <laughs> but really smart. Like, good God, she's smart. <laughs> but yeah, it was always that. And I remember people would always pick me up. That was the biggest thing that I remember is that I don't think I walked anywhere for like ever because people just felt bad. You so need to be carried. Random strangers. My brother would always have me on his back. He was always giving me back rides because he just couldn't fathom the blue child walking and so that was the biggest thing I remember about being sick. Also about having a Make-A-Wish and then turning to my mother and asking if I was going to die. <laughs> oh my! Oh, hold it on! Was Back up heavy, a second. But I mean, I remember a lot of stuff. So, about being so a sick this kid. was this was a touch and go. Yeah, we'll get into how touch yes, and go it is so at, at this point. But what was your Make-A-Wish? Uh, Disneyland. I was fine. I had siblings. Disneyland. But, but does right. I mean does Make a Wish? Does that mean that like okay we don't know we don't yeah know. it was before the seven year old it was kind of one of those we don't know it was uh it was very much a we don't know we don't know whether or not you know I mean there's there's but you strong remember chances. it dawning on you yeah. at Disney World yeah. Disneyland because everyone was treating me so wonderfully and uh, I knew mm. I was a sick kid so it was like one of those like I remember turning and I had a Donald Duck in my hand I turned and I was like am I gonna die and my mom was like ooh, ooh, ooh. And uh, and I just remember the whole trip, like literally, we'd be having so much fun, and my siblings would be like, "We're gonna miss you," <laughs> and it was so dark and so heavy. In hindsight, it's one of the funniest moments of my life because it's it's fantastic. What's your relationship with Disney at this point? At Disney, at this point, it was just heavy. It was also like, "Let's go on the teacups." They're like, "Can she go on the teacups?" What yes, about let's now? Go on the teacups. <laughs> can, can you watch it? Uh, no, frozen honestly. And, uh, yeah, and I mean, not... I can without the plot holes, but I can. <laughs> um, come on, Olaf gives the true love. You know, he yeah. melts for her. That's the true love. <laughs> Clearly. Thing. Come on. Yeah. Figure it out. But yeah, I mean, I can do, I mean, I actually recently was talking about going to Disneyland again because when I went when I was younger, it was like a kind of dark. It was like one of those like, I don't think I like this. I have bad memories attached yeah, yeah. to this magical, wonderful place. But now it's different, I think, because- the Another Disney surgery at uh-huh. 13. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And was that the final one? No, since- I'll have to have open heart surgeries my whole life. It's really? like a car. It's like a, you know, like you go in and you replace the things that are in there. And so, I mean, there's valves. The good thing is, is my one when I was 13 was supposed to last like maybe six to eight years. And now it has lasted 16. So it's kind of like, you know, that in it of itself is a miracle. Is this like a pig valve situation? It is, it's a bovine valve actually. Oh, you got bovine valve. I got bovine valve. I got bovine valve, I got Gore-Tex, I got wire in the chest, I got a 37 year old male artery, I got all of it, I got all the good stuff. Yeah. So you got a little people, little per, like, another I got person a whole bunch in there. Of people in you there. got an animal. You I got, got some a million people's blood. I bionics. can't count how many people's blood I have in there. But. So, so what? Okay, so what is the the day to day with this condition? Is this the kind of thing that's like I can't get too excited because I might have a heart attack? You know, I can't do this. No, I think, and I think so much of it is mind over matter. It really is because I've been to sick groups with with people with my condition, and I'm like, oh God, I am not these people. Like I am so far beyond that. And a lot of that was good parenting, honestly. Was my parents going like, I'm going, I'm going to run to the river. And they're like, great, as they're panicking behind hmm. to see if I'm okay. But never once did they ever say I couldn't do anything. Like honestly, ever. It was one of those things. I remember there was one field trip I couldn't go on because the elevation was too high. And they were like, we just can't. Like you're a liability. We can't do it. And like my school wouldn't let me. And my parents were like, hmm. we'll take her. We'll make sure she's okay. But in reality, I should never have gone up that high in elevation. And even now, so you can't fly. Uh, no, I can absolutely fly. But it's just like walking, like so. I could never do Everest. I know that now in my just heart. because you're going to get too windy. Just because it's going to be too uh, windy. Not enough oxygen. But in your most blood. people can't do Everest. Like most people, you know, like if you have any, I cannot. You cannot. Just, yeah, I'm just going to go on. I tried, <laughs> tried it. Got to base camp and turned back. Base camp, turned back. I mean, there's a dead zone. <laughs> like, yeah, that dead if, zone. If something's called a dead zone, I, can't. I don't aspire to go there. <laughs> yet. Yeah, exactly. So no, I mean, there's things in that sense, but a lot of it is just me going, no, I can do this. I know I can, like, and pushing yourself and knowing that you're going to be okay and I have faith that I'm going to be okay. And 
And I am a really good governor of myself. Like I've never, you know, again, marathon, not going to happen for me. I think I could absolutely if I tried and if I trained and if I really felt comfortable with it. But that is just nothing I never aspire to do. How do you know when it's time for another surgery? What are the the signs? That's the dilemma is that I go every six months, I get checked out and they'll just say, you know, there's like valves that are like thickening and closing. And so they have to worry about that. And then there's like things that the shunts that are leaking and they have to, you know, kind of do, they do a million and a half tests on you to see, you know, if this is okay, if that's okay. And then they just kind of deduct from there. The cool thing about it is that I have a, like a killer surgeon, a killer, killer surgeon. He's like, you know. Top three in the world, and so interesting choice of words there. But. Yeah, oh, sir, what surgeon? Killer surgeon. Killer surgeon. Killer surgeon. <laughs> he. Well, I just remember like vividly when I was seven. He looked like he. Like, I think he came off like a ski trip when you know, when I was like rushing to. Surgery. He like had on goggles. Yeah, like he was just like well, you know, he's this Australian guy that just like came off a ski trip, and I was like, how is this male model my surgeon? Like, that doesn't feel right at all. But you, apparently, he's a big deal. Yeah. So you seemed to describe. Um, the you being born and that happening as a real turning point in your dad's life, I think so, or your yeah. family's life, yeah. and him beginning to be a pastor again. Yes. Um, I'm curious, what what what's been your source of strength and coping mechanism? I mean, there was no turning point; that was the beginning of your life. Yeah. But I, I'm curious if it sounds like that you have a a real gift for a sense of humor <laughs> associate I mean obviously yeah. in general but associated with this did you always deal with it with a sense of humor what, is that something you developed later as a 7 as a no. as a 13 year old were you able to laugh at this yeah. even now i would imagine it's difficult no it's not honestly it's not it's kind of like the hand that you're dealt you kind of just i mean like you know it's I, there are so many worse things that i could have that could have happened in my life um, but I do, I think I, I made the decision. I actually remember making the decision to to laugh it off, to like be, it was in the hospital and my mother was actually there and she says now, like she remembers the moment that it happened. There was this girl next to me and she was whining to the nurses. She was just whining and complaining the whole time. And I made the, I made a joke. Like I was joking around with the nurses and they loved me and they it was more attention. It was more like it was a happier environment because I was joking around about stuff. And I remember deciding from that moment that I was like, oh, this can't be something serious in my life. Like this can't be the end all be all. Like it can't be something that takes everything over. Because it can't that's, define you. It can't define you. It really can't. It can define you in the way that you, that it propels you. But it can't like do anything else than that. And I remember making a cognitive choice of just being like, this is so much easier. It is so much easier to laugh about this. It's so much easier to just joke about all this and, and find a sense of humor in it. It sounds like you always you had this instinct for humor as yes. well. That you were always were you always the funny girl? Uh, I was. A big part of it was called I was like the funny girl and I was always the chunky girl too, so that was like that was hand in hand. That goes okay. hand in hand. But yeah, I was always the weird, I mean like class clown in high school, like just the weird kid because it's so much easier. And when did you start funneling that into entertaining people? Um, I mean Honestly, as soon as I could, as soon as I could, I started and it was, I, I mean, I knew I wanted to be an actor pretty much like at a child level, child age. I was like, I want to do this. I want to, however this can happen, however laughter can happen and I can get paid for it. I want to do that. So then I, you know, I did stand up for a couple of years and I really liked it, but I didn't like the scene of it. Um, and I, it was basically in just, like, in like Yosemite Valley, in Yosemite Valley. No, I, I decided I, I was going to move out to LA. My brother had moved to LA and he was, he's an entertainer as well. And he had moved to LA musician, and I was like, right? he's a musician. Yeah. Okay. And he's a, he's a really good actor too, but he is an incredible musician and he has taken that road and that road has taken him. And so it's, yeah, he moved out here and I was like, well, he's out there and I can go out there with him. And then. And then I moved out to LA. And at what stage are we talking? We're talking out of like high school 18, or out of high school? Right out of high school, I was like, I know I want to go out there and try it and do it. And then I went to community college in Pasadena. Mm-hmm. Had crazy theater directors that led me in really great ways because they were actually working actors, which is a fascinating thing to me. That I had a teacher that was a real working actor and being like, instead of like 
art, everybody. And you're like, you're in Cal State Northridge. Um, <laughs> you know. So I had these Like I watch teachers. you on General Hospital and then you come Hospital. in here and. Yeah. I see, I've seen you in Top Gun and now you're going to oh, come here. Top Gun. You know, like, yeah, he was a big deal. He was like one person in Top Gun, but he said that paid for his m- multiple homes. And I was like, man, yeah. <laughs> that's all it takes in the 80s. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Top Gun one, paid well. There's one paid well movie. <laughs> but yeah. So it was like this crazy old man that reminded me of the dude from Big Lebowski that was a big hand in what actually made me go out and do stand up and do that because he was just like he would always he would always be like you know you're funny that's not a thing that happens with women go do it and you'd just be like all right like as misogynistic as it was he was not wrong so why and, why was it, why is that i don't know i mean you know it's actually a difficult world i think for women it's just one of those things where there's multiple facets coming at you of it there's you, I've been in the writing room with men where you say one idea, no one listens to you. Someone says the exact same idea and they're like, good job, bro. And you're like, F you, like uh-huh. eat it, you know? So I've been in those rooms too. And I've also been in the weird thing where there's constantly, if we're going to get really podium about it, there's an intense sexualization of women. And so uh, immediately, I'm not funny if I'm pretty. I'm not yeah. funny if I'm remotely attractive. Or if I am, what's wrong with me? Like, where did it come from? I remember sitting in a group of girls, like actual comedian girls that I surround myself with that are my friends. And we went around the circle and we were like, what, what's wrong with you? And it literally was a list of like, well, I used to be a fat girl. Like, I had issues with my father. Like, this, it was like these things that we were all laughing about. But it was also a weird thing of like, because we had to like push through and find this personality. And it's not saying that these like amazing model type people can't be funny. It's just there's... it. It doesn't happen that often because they're sexualized immediately and they don't need to. And, you know, it's it's just a weird thing that I find that is actually very, very difficult because, you know, even Tina Fey, it's like, well, let, let's see her be sexy. And you're like, does she does she have to be right. like, do, do we have to boil it down? Like Amy Poehler, oh, she she's hideous without makeup. And you're like, yeah, everyone is. We're <laughs> all atrocious without makeup. Like we all look different. So it's just that weird thing that I think from day one. People tiptoe around it. It's getting better. I do think it's getting better. It's getting more of an industry. I think it's fascinating when people are like, wow, women are really coming out in comedy, huh? And you're like, actually, Lucille Ball changed the entire freaking television network. Good point. But, but sure, yeah, m- women are coming. Melissa McCarthy's amazing. You know, like, it's a weird uh-huh. thing where you go like, this woman single-handedly changed the way we film television. But, you know. Are you saying that a lot of the most successful female comedians uh, are have been damaged in some way or there's been they've no, had to overcome something I don't think so I think they've had to make a choice I do think that they've had to make a choice of that road to go down I think it's a weird thing like you have the option where it's like in order to choose comedy it's kind of a hard road like it's kind of one of those mm. things of like no I want to do this because I love it because it's funny and like sure like Amy Schumer is beautiful she's a beautiful girl but she made the choice to be like I'm gonna be this brash out there person I think it is a choice I think it's one of those things that it's not because it's like well you know they're funny so just like let them go it's like it for a woman it tends to be a choice it tends to be a choice of not being funny but like really deciding like like, no I'm gonna be a comedy girl I'm going to be this is what I'm gonna be and it's okay that everyone's gonna try and sexualize me or they're gonna try and not give me a role because I'm too unattractive or I'm too this or too that well it seems like you know you were dealing with this in the comedy world yes and I I, want to connect the dots but Mm -hmm. I I can't resist the fast forward to well then you enter the internet world where it's a it's the same story but maybe even more acidic because there's comments (laughs) right (laughs) yeah no, I mean, it's the same, and I think it'll always be the same world. I think it really will. I think the internet is more heightened versions of it because people can get behind a keyboard and type things out, and, and I've noticed that a lot. And it gets, the good thing about the internet is because is that there's a community of everyone. So there are beautiful young women that you see that see you being you, and it's really cool, and, and they go, oh, this person has a personality, and maybe I can too. And, you know, like, or this person isn't, you know, fixated on, this or that different thing about themselves. Oh, maybe there's can... you don't have to check as many boxes yeah. of a gatekeeper. Yes. to be your true self and to mm-hmm. find yeah, and you every find other these... people who are true who being true to themselves exactly. as an audience. And it's nice. It's also I mean I don't know I would have loved like when I growing up like I, the people that I latched onto it was always the weirdos. Mm-hmm. It was always these weird wonderful women that like 
you know, those were who I latched onto because I was like, that's me. Like, Are you thinking about someone in particular? Uh, well, I was a big Gilda Radner fan. I was a huge Gilda Radner fan. And she was just, she was weird. And she was adorable. Like on SNL? SNL. Like SNL. And also just like in general, like any any interview, I've seen them all. Like I loved her. But she was such a weirdo. And I would just, I remember just being like, oh, I'm okay. Like I am okay mm. being a weirdo. It's not like anything else. Like you can be goofy and weird and that's totally okay. And that was like one of those things. I mean, Amy Poehler is a big one too. Sherry O'Terry, like obviously on SNL too. But there are those big people that you grew up with that you're like, oh, that's totally okay. Like, it gives you that release of like when you're a like, young girl growing up being like, oh, there's plenty, there's dozens of us. <laughs> right. So, so you, you get to LA, you're you're doing the the community college thing. Yes. Uh, and you are trying to find roles, going to auditions. Like, what what's yeah, the story? Yeah, I mean, well, the story was I I I was goofy. I did a whole bunch of theater, and you know, at the community college, and then I had a teacher that was like that that big Lebowski dude. He was like, I need to do stand up. He was like, I need you to write me like a seven minute set of stand up, and I was like, I don't know how to do that. And he was like, Do it. And so I did that, and then he actually was the one that booked me like a million. My teacher booked me a million different gigs. Really? Yeah, doing stand up. He's a magic. Like it was one of those big people in my life. Like that was my Goodwill Hunting, everybody. (laughs) That was my. You know what I mean? Like those are those people in your life that you go, oh, that's a good teacher. That's a teacher. Take me to the first stand up. Because that sounds terrifying. It was terrifying. Um, it was terrifying. It was in this stupid little coffee shop in Pasadena. And I remember doing it and being like, I don't hate this. Like, I don't. I did it. And I was just like, uh. and then I remember a big part of it was actually like being able to like mess with the crowd and talk with the crowd and interact with the crowd. And I was like, mm-hmm. oh, I really don't hate this on any level. And then I decided to keep doing it and then did, you know, different things. I went to the ice house. I did all these different little things. I didn't take it as far as Hollywood. I did like college stuff and then I went, I decided to keep going and then it was just a really acerbic, uh, it's a acerbic kind of thing that I was just like, I don't know if I want to necessarily be in this comedy world of really angry people that are very upset that they didn't get to do a set on, you know, Leno and- Was that, you mean the people that you had to hang out with? The people that I hang out had with. to hang out with. And I, I mean like it, it it's a it's a tough world for anyone because again it's just you it's just you putting forward your stuff you hoping that people pick it up it depends it's such a weird thing because there's rooms are different every night people are different every night it's and especially for comedy you're like I just want to make people laugh like so I just want to do that is that when you switched to more of an improv yes. lane yeah it was more I and then I'd always heard I grew up learning the Groundlings and knowing about Groundlings and everyone that I'd loved had been a part of the Groundlings. So Sherry O'Terry, Melissa McCarthy, um, and you know, like all these wonderful, amazing, Kristen Wiig, Mm -hmm. uh, these wonderful, amazing women had been a part of it. And so I was like, I have to give this a whirl. So I auditioned for it and then got into the classes and it's a huge long process. Yeah, there's a whole there's a whole system, yes, right? Yes, there's a whole system. It's all hierarchy. It's all crazy, and again, it's all comedy, so it shouldn't be that way. <laughs> <laughs> but it, like, but but you you start. I mean, you start. I, I've never done it, and I've just kind of heard that there's you take classes, then you move to a team where you're performing. Yes. But then there's the hierarchy that you're talking about is different teams that perform at on di- different nights or different times well, that are like, more. Uh, high profile. That's it's a that's more of the UCB. The Groundlings is like you okay. take a class, you wait, and then you take another class. And if you pass that class, you get to go into this writing lab. And if you pass a writing lab, if you don't pass a writing lab, you're done with the program. Like you're cut from the whole program completely. And then if you do a writing lab, so it's all it's a sudden death process. It's a sudden every death point. process. Every point, even when you get into the pinnacle of the school, which is Sunday Company, which is every single week you are writing um monday tuesday wednesday wednesday you pitch thursday you decide what goes in the show friday you're getting costumes saturday you rehearse sunday it's up it's live it's a brand new show every single week and i did that for a year and a half in this last year and it was a year and a half of my life where i probably pitched over two thousand sketches wow over and over again probably performed about i know i performed about 230 or 232 is my final number of like how many sketches i performed which is insane um, and you just go and you do this brand new show every single week. And even in that, they vote on you every six months, like whether or not you stay in. And again, at the end of the day, it's like, it's comedy, you know, like it's JJ Abrams didn't pass the program. So, hmm. 
you know, because he's not a good writer. Like, I was like, what? <laughs> like, you know, like, well, that might have been a mistake, you know? So there's people along the way that, like, don't even get into the program that you're like, Sweet D from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, who I think is phenomenal, Caitlin Olson. She made, like, one term in Sunday Company. And I was like, I don't know how that is a thing. Like, I don't. But you made it. So I made it all the way fresh, through. You're fresh off of coming all oh the way God. through the oh, process. Through the process. A two and a half year process. Uh, it was well in total of my life. It was a six year process. Six from year when process. I started. Oh my! I know. I should have a doctorate. So and then, and then, where does it end up? Yeah. What's supposed to be the? The goal is that you get into the main company groundlings. The goal is that, but there's a lot of people that get cut along the way. I was like one of those people that 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 happened to where it was just like, you know, thank you so much for the year and a half. Like we don't see a place for you in the main company growling. And you're like, okay, great. We move on. How because does that, I mean, is that a dramatic it is. point it's in like your a, life? Because what is it, what is that last moment? Is it, does it come down to one performance and then no, you get a report come card? Out, no, you, you would hey, think it would. How does it work? How did it work for you specifically? It worked for me specifically. I did a year and a half of stuff. I did a year and a half of, you know, crazy madness. I grew a lot. I had these phenomenal teachers that, you know, really shaped me along the way. One of them was very akin to J.K. Simmons role in Whiplash. Um, but Ooh. she, I mean, she is a intense, like she's a comedy Nazi, but she made everyone magnificent and fantastic and like it was a weird moment when i was like when she was giving someone attitude and she was like name a person that you like that's from this school i've taught them and i was like she's not wrong you know like, <laughs> she like, gave that speech she's like will ferrell taught him and you're like mm -hmm, yeah that's that's very fair um you know so it's all those people that you go well i can't deny this woman's 28 years of comedy knowledge right um and you paid it to go through this yes, right? you do <laughs> i mean it's actually when you in hindsight whenever you're explaining it to anyone else in the world they're like why why would you do this but at the end of the day you perform every week on a stage that like your favorite people have performed on like i've touch the same areas that Melissa McCarthy and Kristen Wiig and like Jim Rash and all these like Will Ferrell take it back to like John Lovitz, Phil Hartman, like all these people. There's some insane, ethereal, amazing that you just go, I love this. You're like, a part of something, you're a, a legacy. Part of something, a legacy. But then it comes down to a decision. Yeah, we, and that's not and how does yours. that work? It's, I think it's, I mean, it's all very uh, Illuminati, but. <laughs> I mean, are you locked in a cell and they slide yeah, something under the gate? Yeah, basically like, well, it's basically they all go in a room and they vote and see if that person goes on to the main company if they don't. And what would that mean? It, Being it a part of the main company, would, it would mean how would that you, change your life? You know, I think it used to mean a lot more. I think it would normally change people's lives because it was a bigger deal. Like it was one of those things where it was like, you know, you got on the wall and, you know, Lisa Kudrow and, and Kathy Griffin, both, um, you know, Groundlings alum. And so they got on the wall and then they're like, oh, well, the main company Groundling, great. Like give her a role on this and mm -hmm. fantastic. And then they move okay. on. But now it's just a different world. It's just a different like people are there a lot longer and staying a lot. And it's just a different thing. For me, it was like a hard blow of like, you know, I, I was disappointed. I was very disappointed I didn't make it because it's you're always going up to like an end goal of something. But immediately right afterwards, I realized the people in my company that had been cut from the program as well were like these amazing people that I was like, oh, I'd rather be in this. Like when I look back at like who has been there along the way. But it, it, okay, but I, th there's that it's moment. Such a crazy I, thing, I think. I know. It's it's a it's a system that most people can't relate to, but yes. I think what we can all relate to is that moment of uh, decision where it's you were told. Was it a person who told you? Yeah, it was a director that told me like the vote didn't go your way, and you go okay. But in all fairness, I had been to Burning Man, had gotten my tarot cards read, and that it said in my tarot cards that it wasn't going to go my way. Um, <laughs> Are you serious? I'm dead serious. Okay. I'm I am dead, dead serious. serious, actually. So that and was I'm, your response. But it was a guy in a bathrobe that was reading my tarot. Like, I couldn't. Oh. We're in the middle of the desert, and he's in a bathrobe reading my tarot cards. I can't. You know, he's eating a chewy granola bar. I don't but, know. But like, see, so you were uh, semi prepared for I the moment. I was semi prepared for the moment because of the Tower of Terror card that was. <laughs> <laughs> but but e see, even I think that's the beauty of it. Even right now, you exhibit it is the the humor as an ability to process disappointment. These, yeah. I mean, you're telling us that every six months you're having an experience yeah. like that where 
a guy in a bathrobe or a, <laughs> a medical gown or whatever they doctors wear these yes. days. No, I don't think they wear the medical gowns. I don't gowns. think they wear bathrobes either, actually. No, <laughs> or deal tarot cards. They call them scrubs, Link. Scrubs. <laughs> scrubs. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And you're yeah. having to give that response. It's. I mean, I can make the argument that you're you're conditioned on a heart level. Yes. Get a little cheesy here. Oh. To uh, to 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 dominate in this atmosphere in this in the world of entertainment because it's everyone talks about it. it's a series of rejections yeah. until you get what you want yeah it really right? is yeah it really is and or it's you also, get a little bit or do you I even like want life is a series you even get of rejections you until you yeah. get what you want hmm. you know it really is like it's not just this industry because it's every it's every industry it's just or is it is even about bit. getting what you want. I know. Or is it even more about not getting what you want? Life is a series of not getting what you want. That's a little Johnny Cash. but <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll write that song later. Now, <laughs> I can't help but think that the your transition to the internet and the success of SourceFed also, also yes. makes that a little easier to take. Yeah, Be- because, you I know, you, so. the, not that it's necessarily a safety net. I don't, I don't want to use the wrong analogy, but it wasn't. You didn't have all your hopes tied up in that, right? No, I didn't. Because because you were already doing something that was I'm already doing in, something incredibly that I awesome love and, and is and also my create. You know, it's like when you get to create. You know, it's like you get to create what you say. That that's a really nice thing being a key master. It's a beautiful thing being like I'm the master of my domain. Like I know what the voice is that I'm putting out into the world. I don't have to worry about anyone else writing stuff for me. I don't have to worry about anything. And that's a beautiful thing. So I think it did help a lot in that sense where I would just go, well, you know, like we shake it off and move on and, you know, I'm still doing what I love, still doing what I want to do. Mm-hmm. In shake this it off. World. You just quoted your Walmart CD. I did. Also did, Mariah Carey. Oh. Um, you know. Did you, how did you see the source fed opportunity when it came about and what, how did that happen? Honestly, um, it was, it was such a random thing. It was, I I didn't on it. I honestly had no idea. I had no idea about the internet. I had no. I mean, I knew about the internet because I uh, AOL'd a lot, but uh, <laughs> but I didn't know. Like it was just one of those things that I had. Uh, I had an agent at the time that was like, "Hey, here's this thing." But the good news is, you get to write your own stuff. And what do you think? And I went into some weird hole in the wall audition place. And I remember there was they were also auditioning models that day, but not for source, but for something else. And I just remember walking and going, I'm in the wrong place. Like, <laughs> I don't think I'm in the right place here. And it was just we got pop culture news things that we had to give our own opinions on. And I had no idea who Philip DeFranco was. Was, I had no was idea. Phil in the room at this point? No, uh-uh. I was just the producers. And it was actually, I remember the person that put me at, at most huge was Danny Rosenberg. Like she's amazing and she works for Phil and she's at the offices all the time. And she laughed and I remember being like, oh, thank God, like there's someone laughing here <laughs> because it was a hard room. It was actually a, kind of a difficult room. And then you're uh-huh. with like all these dudes and Joe was one of those that was like, you know, he comes off so intense at first, but I was just like, he, you were auditioning for Joe. I was too. auditioning with Joe. With and Joe, I auditioned with Joe, and I auditioned with Steve, and I auditioned with Elliot as well. So they were already sort of in. They were. Already, I don't know if they were. No, she was saying in. they were. They were all. It was all. Auditioning. Okay. It was all auditioning okay. together. Gotcha, gotcha. And I remember Joe came off really intense at first, and I was like, "No, nah, I'm gonna make this kid my friend." And I like immediately just started being very lovey to him, and he, you know, melted like a stick of butter. <laughs> and um, and it was just one of those very. I don't know. It was just. I remember ranting about pop culture things. And then not thinking about it again until they called. Like, not even thinking. It was just one of those, like, well, I'm in a hole in the wall. Like, once again, a hole in the wall where I get to do this. I do remember getting really excited about having my own opinion about something and being able to put that straight forward. And then it was, I mean, I guess the rest is history. You got through the gauntlet and you became uh, one of the main hosts. But it was a crash course in... uh, In internet. In internet. Yeah, and yeah. internet. Yeah. Yeah, so what was that like? What was that process of, okay, I'm on this thing. I, if you hadn't been watching YouTube videos, yeah. you didn't know anything about the world, and all of a sudden you're the face of a very popular thing. Yeah, it, I mean, that was, honestly, it was one of those, like, I, I had no idea what I was getting into. I had no idea what I was getting into. I remember the first week, Elliot Morgan made me sign up for Twitter, because I was like, what's Twitter? <laughs> And he was like, good God, woman. <laughs> like, just <laughs> like, so he made my Twitter name. He made my Twitter like handle. He set me up on Twitter. And then, you know, I mean, it was actually very overwhelming, but I was just like, I think we're a part of something 
I think we're a part of something. It was one of those like, I think this is a big deal. I think this is like, I think we're actually part of something. I do also remember the best thing about it was that those boys, I remember being like, I, for once I'm in a room with two men that see me 100% as an equal, that are writing for me 100% as an equal, if not writing better parts for me than they were writing for themselves. Like it was a really beautiful thing of like these people coming together that had the same humor, the same intention. And I don't know if that was a beautiful happy accident. I don't know if that was just something that, you know, people saw, but it, it was what it was. And I remember that was the biggest thing for me is being in the room with those two boys and going like, oh my God, this is going to be something because we love each other, because mm. we're so excited and because we get each other on a humor level that is v- very rare, to be honest. Like, it's and like you, weren't stepping in, you weren't stepping into a, an established system yes. or hierarchy where there Nothing was already was, It was this, just kind of like, we, I yeah. think we're going to do this. And then it changed a lot from, I think, the original what people wanted it to be. It was just supposed to be a very opinionated this. And instead, you had these three people that did love the humor side of it and did love all that. And so I think it changed a lot with intention, with the intention and it became what it was. But I remember that was that was the biggest thing that I remember going, oh, this is gonna be something because we all really like each other and we all get along and this is so much fun, you know? Mm-hmm. So that was a really big awakening for me. Uh, when you first remember knowing that you'd become internet famous. When they were doing the Maxim thing. That was the creepiest and the craziest and most wonderful thing ever. Um, yeah, tell us about that. It was just, uh, I, I think our producer said it as a joke. And then the boys said were like, what? said, um, there's a Maxim Hot 100 list where you write in people. What if we did Lee? Because someone put it in the comments. Like a whole bunch of people were like, we should put Lee in there, blah, 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 blah. And I think it was a big thing for the producer to be like, I wonder if we could actually do this. Like, I wonder if we could actually, you know, like, it was more of just a the number, like thinking. a producer thinking, just being like, uh-huh. what does our army entail, right. you know? And so, and then I was like, God, that's not going to happen. And the boys took it on immediately and were like, oh, no. And so they made a video. And I remember they were like, oh, we crashed the site. And I was like, how? In what world <laughs> is this a thing? So, so that they, was so a they, big. They, they, Joe and Elliot, right? Joe what? and Elliot were like they they kind of jumped on board with it. They were like, oh yeah, like let's just see. It was it was. I think a big part of it was like let's see if we could do this. Like it wasn't uh, for me. It was like pfft, you know. And so they mm-hmm. sent people to the site to vote. To uh, vote. R- rumor has it that. Maxim then installed a CAPTCHA yes, uh, requirement. Yes, they did because, because of so it. Because so many people because, were voting for you. And they had crashed the site multiple times. <laughs> I mean, that is the power of the internet. Well, and, and now uh, the net result is, well, you were on the, yes. the Hot 100, number 57. I was, number 50, Heinz 57 is how and, I uh, And you have, a, <laughs> you have a Maxim profile that I people can go check out. I have a Maxim profile check out. that people can, which is not something I never thought I would ever be able to say. I had the most clothes on too, if anyone ever wants to check <laughs> how, that out. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so it you find it funny. How do you feel about it? I mean, it's one of those baffling things to me. Like, I don't get it. I'm like, sure, okay. Like, if you meet me, you might think differently because I fart on the reg. Um, <laughs> <that's>, <laughs> they, so do the rest yeah, of the girls on the so list. So do the rest of the girls on the list. Right. I'm sure they just sound like flowers and whispers <laughs> coming out. Uh, whereas mine, it's a two-ton truck. But... <laughs> But for, you know, I mean, it's kind of one of those baffling things. Like, I don't get it, but I'll go along with it, sure. And in a weird way, it's kind of nice to be like, I feel like I might want to be one of the only normal people that actually eats, you know, normal stuff. And, you know, actually, I don't know, I might be one of the normal people. And then that's kind of nice for me. For me, I'm like, oh, I'm normal. And I, my Boobs are barely showing. There's a cleavage line, and that's about it. <laughs> and it could be my scar. Who knows? But that was one big thing too that they were like, Can "Scar we or cleavage out your scar? line?" And I was like, "Absolutely not. You cannot photoshop. That is mine. No scars, no proof. Like, ain't happening." And then, yeah, that was a big thing about it. I was like, I was gonna be in a leather jacket. I demanded to be covered on every level, mainly because I was like, I have a mother and father still. <laughs> so <laughs> there's there's around. two there's. Uh, there's two sides to what you're saying right now. Mm-hmm. There's the one side of, I love this position of strength and confidence in who you are. Yeah. And But I know even in the most recent video you talked about, uh, it's true of everyone, we're all self-conscious. You know, you yeah. you put it out there, you were talking about your self-image. And yeah. You're talking about the people commenting, are you pregnant and how you wanna <laughs> lose weight. You know, you've got, so that's the other side of it mm-hmm. is there is a, um, there's a self-consciousness too, I guess. Yes, of course. I mean, I think there is with everyone. I mean, it is, it's, 
there's harsher things on women, but there's harsher things on men too in a different world, in a different world of providing and, and where you success. Success for men is a woman's body. Like women's sexual image is how men are, you know, in their success. Like that's, it's, mm-hmm. that's the equivalent in my mind. So it's a weird thing. Like, I, I mean, there are still self-conscious things. I've grown up with it. Like it's been, I've been a chubby kid since, since puberty which I think did form a lot of who I am and did form a lot of just like, I'm going to make you my friend, not through you wanting anything from me, but through me making you laugh, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think that was a big part of it. I think self-consciousness is just one of those things that is human nature. I said in the vlog recently that like, really the only thing I've struggled with more than my weight is the idea that it defines me, is the idea that it defines my self-worth. Because it is such a weird thing that like even going out and auditioning for roles, like, They'll be like, oh, we want like a, a heavier girl. And you're like, great. So you get there and then they're like, no, like, no, like a heavier girl. And you're like, okay. And then they go, we want a normal girl. You go to something and they go, no, like a normal girl. So no matter what, you're put in these different mm. brackets of like, it, it shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter, but it does. And that's the unfortunate world that we live in is that, you know, for me, it was the big weight loss thing was like, I don't want to be any part of what holds me back in this world. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't want to hold myself back. I don't want to be the person that has enough talent and enough drive to go places. But because the world sees me in a certain light or doesn't see me as normal or sees me as a thicker girl or sees me as a this, like, I know that I'm not ever going to be the leading lady, but I'll always be the quirky friend when it comes to a <laughs> NBC sitcom. I'm okay with that because that's a way more fun role. But right. it's just that thing of, you know, the self-conscious factor always plays in. I think it does with everyone. So for me, it was more of a thing of, I would rather not get those comments of, are you pregnant? Again, I'm not. Um, <laughs> like, <laughs> to clarify. Not for a while, guys. It's going to happen someday. But it's just, you know, those things of, for me, it was more along the lines of not getting rid of those comments, but feeling better about myself in the sense of, you know, I, taking control because control is a big part of it. You know, for the last year and a half, I was doing sketch comedy, which lends itself to a lot of horrible food at midnight and 3 a.m. decisions. Mm. And right. it lends itself to you sitting in front of a computer all day, every day. You rarely hike on Runyon and talk about <laughs> sketch ideas. But you know. the, you know, being in the Maxim Hot 100 is kind of a victory in turning that mm-hmm. on its ear and saying, I'm going to do it on my terms and you're yes. not, not going to change who I am. And, and at the same time, it's a victory for the internet because we get to decide who we say is hot, yes. not some... Mag airbrushed magazine. Exactly. And I but, think that is a big part of it. You know, I don't know. I think that is one of those things of, I, I feel like, I mean, there's people like Megan Tongis, who I love so much because she has that like body revolution, the booty revolution where she's just like, I'm taking, we're changing the idea of what mm-hmm. defines a person. And that's a big deal. So you know? the maximum thing is a touch point. It's a touch point. <coughs> oh, no. Touch point for your fame. Uh, uh, another one. Something uh, is a uh, another one. I, w- we got the inside scoop oh, because no. Kevin, our producer, is friends with your boyfriend. Uh huh. Yeah. 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 And uh, so we hear there's a Target story uh, uh, being recognized. Oh in Target. yeah, <laughs> yeah. There is. Uh, it was like actually probably one of the most uh, mildly embarrassed. Well, it was pretty embarrassing actually. I rarely get embarrassed, but this was one of those where uh, oh, we, we got were an in, embarrassing. Sto- I know okay, an embarrassing do it. story. I Give know. it up. Um. Well, I was in a Target with uh, my boyfriend, and I, I I think I'm a lot to handle as a human being, <laughs> but uh, he wanted to go to the home section. I did not, so I proceeded to throw a, a fit where in which I laid down on the ground and just decided to not go anywhere. <laughs> like on your back? Like on my back. Like I was like, I'm not going. I'm yeah. not doing it. I can't move. Like if you want to go to the home section, you drag me. Yeah, kind of the classic toddler <laughs> the move. The classic toddler <laughs> move, which I tend to do a lot actually it's i find it hilarious um but and also get you get your way guys as a almost 30 year old woman that won't move and laying down in target <laughs> but you were doing it for comedic i was effect. doing it for comedic okay. effect he was laughing it wasn't like a thing like i was doing it for comedic effect i'm okay. just like i can't i don't i don't possibly have a target home goods section like rant i don't have anything I'm, in me left all that, that being said i'm still getting very nervous at this point <laughs> well so then i was just like no no and some Target employee came up to me and I thought like he was gonna be like ma'am get off the floor <laughs> and instead he was like are you Lee Newton and I was like oh crap <laughs> like, yes I am Let I'm me just get up. throwing a fit in front of and it was probably the most biggest victory for my boyfriend because he was just like see 
<laughs> now you can't do that. You got to watch yourself. Like, you have to watch uh, yourself. Yeah. So that was a big uh, defining moment of I was like, oh, I, I think I might not be able to do weird things in public anymore. I think, and if I do, at least it'll be part of my brand. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, but, yeah. and, and now it, now that the Groundlings thing is, that has kind of come. Yes. You know, to an end that, to an end. which I can only imagine how crazy your schedule was at, at, at those times. Yeah, it was about a, it was like fifty hour work weeks of sketch comedy wow. plus on top of a yeah yeah and plus source yeah. yeah. So I mean, what does it look like now, and what are you doing with that extra time? And I know one of them is is focusing more on your personal channel. Yeah, one of them is focusing more on my personal channel. Another one I just got done with this CBS Diversity Showcase, which. Um, I am Native American. No one would ever be able to tell because uh, I have a fantastic colorist and because my father's vicious Irish side took over. Um, but that was a big thing I did. And, you know, I mean, now it's it's going into the personal channel. Now it's a weird thing of pilot season. There's a weird part of me that, like, I love the Internet. I love that. I still love acting. I love acting and doing all that stuff, too. So it's that weird. I have agents and managers that all pitch you to crazy weird things and... So you know. r- right now, when you say it's pilot se- season, uh, is it the casting phase? Like you're, you're auditioning. Phase, auditioning for pilots everywhere and, you know, doing all this crazy, you know, weird stuff. And what I mean, do you mean weird? Like, I mean, you example. just, examples are like, I mean, you just, it's making an ass of yourself for comedy again, but it's in, a, in an audition room. In an audition room where you have to like take it so, you know, like there's every sitcom, there's, you know, hyperboles of people. It's just like there's like, okay, now this girl's a valley girl, but she's such a valley girl. So you have to go in and you dress the part and you go in and you're just like, oh my God, no way, what's happening? How is this happening? And you're like, this is a ridiculous thing that ABC <laughs> will never pick up, but I'm going to. You, you got to go for it. You have to go for it. You have to be those people that go for all those different things of like oh and then with this one they want like a and I didn't mean you have to go lady. for the part I meant you have to go for it you have to go all the way all the way in your performance yes because there's you know again there's different key masters that are in charge of that world you know there's and uh, Pat Oswalt had a really great thing that he talked about in a Just for Laughs uh, commencement speech that was really wonderful but it was, he was talking about how the internet has redefined the key master the internet has you know, and he was, he held up his iPhone and he was like, there's more power in this than when Orson Welles, you know, made Citizen Kane. And you're like, crap, that's totally true. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of nice to unless have. Unless the battery's dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's kind of nice to have both facets though, to like sit there and you, I mean, I see things like, I loved being a part of my music. I walked on set of my music and I had all these, this crew and this set. And I was like, holy crap, this is legit like this is a legit thing Mm -hmm. i'm looking at a legit schedule i'm learning how to be in this world through an internet thing Mm -hmm. which is fascinating to me and it's kind of really exciting too so there's multiple different things of trying out this world and it seems like the pattern um of uh source fed is people are on source fed and then Mm -hmm. they do it for a while and then they move on to they something move else. Move on to something else. Uh, yeah. So, what's the story with you? Is that I'm the last of the fi- of the first three, which is a weird feeling to feel because you're always like, you know, I'm. I mean, I miss my boys completely, but I do know that there's like tremendous new talent coming in, and that's really exciting to see. I l- I would like to think of like that as an SNL type place where you know Phil Hartman comes back and does something, Mike Myers come back comes back and hosts. For me, it's one of those I don't know when I will be leaving SourceFed. I know that it's not long for me. I know that it's not it's not my end goal. And I think anyone that knows me knows that it's not my end goal. Do I always like hold a place for it? Do I always plan on still having my face on that channel as long as I possibly can and popping in and doing that? Absolutely. Because I still believe in it and I still think it's like such a wonderful place for stuff. And so I don't, I have no idea where I stand in the sense of like actually that taking over. And right now I'm even down to like, I'm, I'm not there as much as I used to be, you know, because other stuff in life has taken over. But I do still think it's such a wonderful place and I'll always be that person that like pops in and does a comment, comment only on weekend update, you know, <laughs> like. So it's just, there's things like that, but I, I don't know how much longer I am going to be there. I know that it is going in really great directions. I think that it has different things for a lot of different people, and, and I, I hope to be there in some respect, kind of always. Well, let me ask way. an easier uh, planning question, uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, since you bring it up. I mean, so 
I mean, when are you going to have a baby? Oh God, that's really let's look into it. There's like a subliminal. Let's really think about it, guys. Um, I don't know. (laughs) I have no idea. I have a niece. She's killer. She's like really doing great on the niece front. And after about four hours, I go. These are a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't know. You're the one. You've mentioned it number a number of times. I, I was just I wanted to make sure. I know. Well, it's one of those things that you just have to let everyone know. I'm not going to. It's a weird thing as a woman. There's so much things. Where it's like I wish if if someone else could have it. Oh man, I'd have four. But uh-huh. <laughs> four or five at least. I think I want a dog first, and then I have start to with die. A dog. start with a dog. Okay, yeah. Because I do love dogs. I really do love dogs. But that would be if Must Loves Dogs wasn't already a romantic comedy. That would be my romantic <laughs> comedy. But <laughs> Must <laughs> Love Dogs. <laughs> but I do love animals, and so I feel like that's a good start, right? Is animals before babies, career before animals, all that. So, what's the name of the dog you don't have, or? The, the kid that you don't have. Uh, that, the name of the child one? that I don't have uh, will be Timer. Uh, Wait, say, the that, name, say that again. Timer. Timer. It's a cool name. It's a like cool a old name. a guy who keeps yep. time? Yep. I'm and, not uh, laughing at it. I'm just, it's a pretty sweet I'm, name. Don't steal it, anyone. I'm just letting you know. With a Y? Like, uh, with a T-I-M-E-R. Timer. Okay. It's just simple. And when did you choose this? T-H-Y-M-E-R. I heard it once and I was like, dude, that's a cool name. What grade were you in? No, I agree with that. <laughs> no, no. It, uh, it wasn't. How close listen, to childhood Lee, were you? It wasn't someone's name. It was a swim. Name. They said timers. <laughs> Timer. And I was like, <laughs> well, man, there's a lot of timers here. That's a here. cool sounding dude. <laughs> that's basically it. Was how are all those guys great. named Timer? <laughs> I, I, I like. I like really interesting names. Interesting, cool names. I like names that are occupations. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. So that's a great one. It's either that or cobbler. So you know. <laughs> so, also, timer or shoes, cobbler is cobbler. The, cobbler is the dog's name. No, cobbler could be uh, the dog's name would be Snarf. Ooh. Snarf or beef, beef or snarf. Depending, I need to see the dog. But snarf or or snar- snoot snout. But snarf is a real one that I've <laughs> I snoot snout. talk it's, constantly I about knew, wanting a snarf. I knew that you had thought about these names. I know, of course. I don't because know why. I talk about. I had a vivid dream three nights ago that I adopted this dog named Buster, and I remember like texting my boyfriend and being like, "Oh God, like I'm heartbroken. I woke up. I He's didn't not have real. a Buster." Busted. And he was like, we have to get past this. <laughs> like, <laughs> this cannot be a he thing. He doesn't want a dog? No, of course he wants one. But it, I think he's probably tired of me going like, when are we going to get a dog? <laughs> <laughs> Figure it out. Snarf. Like, let's get a dog already. Dream dogs. Dream dogs. That's where I'm at. Get a career. Get a dog. Well, get you know, that pen. I'd love for you to sign apartment. this table. Yeah, do oh, that. Oh, yeah. how wonderful. Find a, find a space. This is a lot of fun. It was great to uh, hang out. Thanks you for coming You guys got in. a lot of podium talk. There's a lot of, That's good. you know, we needed I that. mean, who knows? Also, remembering to remind everyone that I mainly base my humor in farts. So, you know, I mean, it can all be, you know, it's like, really, really how much validity does she have? I second that instinct. You know, <laughs> instinct. Oh, oh nice. Oh, very Left nice. Tee off. I put it over there. Uh, there's an XO and there's three exclamation points. Just Perfect. to get really excited. Thanks, Lee. Oh, thank you. There it is, our ear biscuit with Lee Newton. Super appreciative uh, to Lee for coming in and being at the round table of Dim Light. Let her know what you think by tweeting at her. Her handle is Lee Newton says. Lee Newton says. So hashtag give her, ear biscuits. Yeah, give her that hashtag and let her know what you thought of this. Uh, I gotta say that I, uh, when I was listening to Lee talk about this jam that she's been making, mm-hmm. I, I tried not to be too overzealous, but I was expressing a distinct interest in it. Oh yeah, I, I picked up on that. You were you really perked up in it when she started right. talking about jam. Well, I want to be on the list. I want to be on the list, Lee. That's the deal. I want to be on the list. When she makes that jam, I want her to have a ret jar. Well, I mean, she basically said that I'm in if I give her some of my dad's barbecue sauce. So, uh, I mean, you could we could work out a distribution but, deal from her to me to you if you want. But you also said that your dad can't ship the barbecue sauce. He brings it out like from a trailer at Christmas time. But she also said that he can ship it out and that he's holding out on me. And so I have to have a conversation with my dad 
It's like, what, yeah, what, dad, is it not shippable? Okay, so this is how it works. You ship the barbecue sauce, no, your dad ships the barbecue sauce to you, you hand deliver the barbecue sauce to Lee, it's a big jug, you get two jars of jam, you bring them back, you give me one. That sound like a deal? I'm missing a, one component, what do you give me? <laughs> I gave Money. You, I gave you the idea. The, <laughs> I expressed you gave me the, the interest. You gave me the distribution plan. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Plan. I'm the facilitator. I'm the facilitator. The facilitator gets a cut. Cut a jam. I like boysenberry. You like boysenberry? I like all jams. Jellies, yeah, that's for the birds. What's the, jams. What's the real difference? Do you know? Um, I know it when I see it. I've always thought that the jam had more fruit in it and the jelly was just like a gelatin. Yeah, something but like that. But what's preserves? Preserves are jam to me. No, I think preserves, you can put things in them. Like but you, you can, can preserve in a jam things in them. Like a dead animal. You could put pres you could preserve like an old a little chicken in a in jam, in preserves. I'm sure that the music came in a long time ago <laughs> and people were like, I know that they're gonna keep talking about the difference between jellies, jams, and preserves, but, but you, Ear Biscuiteer, are on your way out and um, yeah, but we're gonna keep talking about it. You but know, you should. I, 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 I'll preserve anything, especially if it's jam. Okay, well, you said the Ear Biscuiteers were on their way out, and that's fine as long as they find their way back in next week, because we will be here. I was gonna say same time, same place, but I mean, we will, but you can enjoy this whenever you want to. Anytime, any place. We'll be here. Shove us in your ears. Mm, shove us in your ears, I like that. New slogan, okay. See you next week. <laughs>